So there was a couple who had two young boys, age 8 and 10. And those boys were always getting into trouble. Always getting in trouble at school, in the community. They were just mischievous little boys. And the parents got concerned and said, we know that anytime anything goes wrong at school or in the community, they're going to get blamed. So we've got to do something about it. And so they heard about a preacher who had some experience working or disciplining young boys and getting them into a line and getting them into a line. So the mother contacted the preacher and explained the situation. And he agreed to see the boys. But he wanted to see them one at a time. So the mother said, okay. And so the younger boy, the eight-year-old, goes in and sits down. And the preacher says, where is God? And the little boy just sits there, getting a little nervous. He didn't say anything. The preacher said, where is God? The little boy just kind of started getting a little more nervous, you know, kind of twitching a little bit. So the last time, the preacher was getting frustrated. He said, where is God? And the little boy jumps up and runs out the door, ran all the way home, up the stairs, in the closet, and hid. And hid. His brother comes, sees all of that. He comes in and says, what's going on? He said, Johnny, God is missing, and they think we had something to do with it. <laughs> so it's a humorous story uh, to really point to uh, what I want to talk about today is this idea that we have uh, that we still hold on to somewhat, somewhat, I think, about this punitive God. A God that is judging, a God that is rewarding us if we're good, a God that is punishing us if we're bad. You know, we have this idea from our Judeo-Christian heritage about that idea. And it leads us to this concept of sin and guilt punishment, damnation, all of those ideas that most of us in this room have kind of left behind, or we want to leave it behind, right? But I have an idea, though, that even though we want to leave it behind, we say, oh, I've given up the idea of sin, I've given up feeling guilty, I've given up thinking that I need to be punished, or in any way being damned for doing wrong, I do think that it's such an ingrained part of our embedded theology that we are hanging on to it. And I think it, it's damaging to us individually and to us as a society. We find that when... when I'm, let me just speak for myself. When I judge myself as doing something bad or wrong, I don't want to think that I deserve to be punished, but it's so much a part of my consciousness that it plays out for me. I criticize myself. I speak to myself in very negative ways. And sometimes I even remove myself from others. I isolate myself. I probably engage in behaviors that are not necessarily supportive of my, my total well-being. And I don't think I'm alone in that if we're honest. That many of us, when we do something or we think something or in some way act, that we, that our traditional way of thinking might call sin, we feel guilty, but it doesn't stop there. We, we punish ourselves in some way. Or we do something, we feel guilty, and then we project it onto somebody else. We want them to help have the blame. Somebody's got to be to blame, right? I mean, there's got to be blame. So I want to make you guilty. If I make you guilty, then you deserve punishment. Now, you may think that you've given all that up. But I don't think we have really given all of that up. 
But I think it's our opportunity to look at it, reframe it, understand it, and move beyond this idea of sin and guilt and punishment and damnation. Because I think we're hanging on to it as a culture. And I think it's damaging for us. Somebody is bad. Somebody is wrong. You know, we think God determines what's bad, what's good, what's, what's bad and what's good, and what's right and what's wrong. And as we know, we create God in our image. Right? We've created God in our image. But we're the ones who are judging. There's not a God out there that's judging. You know, even in New Thought, and I'm going to dare to say this, there is an element of that that says, well, if you, ha- if you get illness, it's because you were thinking the wrong thing. Or because you were in the wrong consciousness. Or something happens in your life, well, what were you thinking? What lesson were you trying to learn? You know, as if there's a, and, and we, we talk about it as the universe. Well, the universe does respond to us, but it's still metaphysical guilt. <laughs> yeah. It's metaphysical guilt. And we believe that we're punished because of it. Well, I want to call us on that a little bit today and invite us into something different because I don't think that is what the master teacher Jesus would have taught us. And I've told you that my theme for Lent is is love, the religion of Jesus. What did Jesus really teach about that? I did some research this week, and of all of the references in the Bible to the word sin, very few are, are related to our reference or Jesus were anything about what Jesus had to say. And when he did talk about sin, he didn't talk about it as something you have to be punished for. Even the disciples even said when he found, you know, the man was, I think it was the crippled man or something, and he said, Well, who sinned? Him or his father? And Jesus said, Nobody. That's not the way it works. God doesn't work that way. So Jesus taught something different. He was radical in his approach to love. Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. Walk two miles if somebody makes you walk one mile. If somebody steals your coat, give them your shirt. You know, radical, radical. Love. So he taught us, I think, to respond differently to that. And I, I use the story of when he came, came upon the woman who had been caught in adultery. And the Pharisees were there and ready to stone her to death. And trying to trap Jesus, uh, trying to show people that Jesus was not really who he said he was, they said, well, she broke the law. This is the punishment for that law. Don't you agree that she should be stoned? So Jesus stops for a moment. He bends down and he writes something in the sand. And then he says to them, if you are without sin, you cast the first stone. And they all walk away. And so when he stands up and sees that they've gone, he says to the woman, did not anyone condemn you? And she said, no. And he said, neither do I. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. And with that, uh, I want to remind us, I shared this with you once before, Howard Thurman, who was a great civil rights leader, theologian, uh, teacher, has this to say about that story. This is how Jesus, he talks about the story, and then he says, this is how Jesus demonstrated reverence for personality. He met the woman where she was, and he treated her as if she were already where she now willed to be. In dealing with her, he believed her into the fulfillment of her possibilities. He believed her into the fulfillment of her possibilities. He stirred her confidence into activity. He placed a crown over her head for which for the rest of her life she would keep trying to grow tall enough to wear. 
powerful take on that story. And so I think what I get from that story and what Jesus was teaching about sin is that these behaviors are not a a cause for punishment. When we think about sin, we think about it as the archery term, which means to miss the mark. Or what Charles Fillmore said, sin is error thinking. Thinking is not in alignment with your true nature. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to say there. It was calling her up to the remembrance of her divine nature, her true self, and saying, I don't condemn you. I recognize who you really are. And as you begin to recognize who you truly are, accepting that, realizing that, recognizing that, then you are inspired to take action from that place. I think that's what Jesus was teaching in that story. So how do we apply that? Well, I want to share with you something else about me personally this week. I had an opportunity to learn, to practice what I preach. (laughs) We teach what we need to learn. I found that out the hard way. Uh, A situation arose for me this week. I, I... I won't give you much detail because I don't want to betray any confidences, but it arose this week in which I was aware, became aware of, of uh, someone's activity, someone's uh, way of approaching a particular situation, some communication that this person had had with other people. And I will tell you what, my immediate reaction was, you are guilty of doing the wrong thing. You should not have done that. You should not have said that. You should not have written that. All of that was going through my mind. I was making him guilty, I'm telling you. And I be God, I wanted him punished. I wanted him fired. I wanted him to be called on the carpet. I wanted him to receive what I believed he deserved. Now, I do not relish admitting that to you today. But it's true. And I will tell you, I was resolute for days in my judgment. For days. Until I really was, I started studying this story. How would Jesus respond? What would love do, as Robert shared? What would love do? And I was reminded that what I had never, ever heard in that story before. And I don't really even know why it's a part of the story. I can make up my own meaning for the story. When Jesus knelt down and wrote in the sand, what was He writing? It doesn't really say in the story. Maybe He wasn't writing anything. I have an idea. What worked for me was that Jesus was drawing a finger labyrinth to calm Himself down. He was just stooping down to connect, to stop, to slow down, to listen. To listen to what was within Him. What wanted to be revealed through him in this situation? And I think he was calling us up to this idea of seeing the highest and best in each other, of getting away from the idea that we have to be punished for actions that we believe are out of alignment with whoever chose to make these laws or rules. We create a lot of rules. I know I have my own rules, but you all don't live by them. (laughs) That's the problem. You don't live by my rules. I would imagine you probably have your own set of rules that sometimes people don't live by. 
And that's why we want to punish people, right? So I think Jesus was saying, let's see the highest and best in each other. Let's reflect on that. As Thurman said, let's choose something different. Let's call each other up to our highest potential rather than blaming and guilting and damning each other and punishing each other. And so I was able to phone a friend <laughs> and uh, get some guidance. I mean, that because it's important to have people. That's one reason we have prayer chaplains, community. We, we, we support each other, as I was saying to our new members. We're here to help you remember when you sometimes forget that you're the Christ. I sometimes forget that I'm the Christ. We all do. And it's important to come back to that, to be reminded of that for each other, with each other. And so I was able to stop, to take that example of Jesus and to stop for a time, go apart for a while and reflect, is this who I want to be? What would love do in this situation? Love would see this person for his highest and best to see the Christ and to know that any action any word that is spoken that is hurtful or in some way tr uh, stimulates pain or fear or uh, anger within someone else is really mine. And yet sometimes we do act in ways that are out of alignment with our truth. I was doing that. I was acting in ways that were out of alignment with my truth. And so to come back to that, so I want to just offer us a simple tool. Um, and I want us to say when we get into that place where we notice that we are blaming someone else, wanting someone else to be guilty, wanting to punish someone else, to let the word sin be a reminder for us. S-I-N. This is a tool I want to in practice myself and offer for you today. Sin. S, slow down. Slow down. Stop. Breathe. Self-reflect. What is going on for me? What is happening within me? Why do I want to make this person guilty? Why do I want to blame them? Why do I want them to be Punished. S, S, slow down. Stop. Self reflect. I is intervene. Intervene on those thoughts. Notice the thoughts that you're thinking. Notice your reaction. You, you can, we can sometimes get, I got so involved in that that I didn't stop to reflect. Introspection is also another I word. Introspection. What's going on for me? What's happening within me? How am I reacting to this? Have you noticed sometimes when we get involved in all of that that our bodies start reacting, our, our heartbeat gets faster, our breathing gets more shallow? What's going on? And then the last one that I want to remind us of is, and the word that came to me is the Indian greeting, Namaste. Many of us are familiar with Namaste. The Christ in me, the highest in me, sees and acknowledges the highest and best in you. But I was reading more about that this week and I was struck by the reason and what it really means. And so I'm going to ask you to stand up uh, and this will be my closing today. <clears throat> so I want you to hold your hands out like this for a moment. And we know we've done these exercises. You feel the energy. Just sort of pulse your hands a little bit. Feel the energy between your palms. Doesn't it feel like there's something there? It's energy. It's life energy that's pulsing through you, in you, as you. It's God expressing as you, if you would. 
And in this gesture of namaskar, we bring the hands together, feeling the energy coming together as one. Feel oneness merging as you bring your hands together. Feel the energy of life. Feel the duality of your thoughts dissipating as you bring your hands together. Feel the duality between your humanness and your God self merging. Feel the unity and oneness in that gesture. And now bring your hands toward your heart. And allow that energy to, to connect with the love that is there. And then what I want us to do is just gently bow your head, acknowledging the divine within yourself. Acknowledging who you truly are. And then I want you to turn to another person and do the same thing, bowing to the person, acknowledging within them the highest and best. You might even say namaste. And so we do that in reverence for ourselves, reverence for each other, and on offering of ourselves in service to the highest and best in the other. And so it's a powerful way for us to acknowledge that. So again, S-I-N, stop, breathe, slow down, I, introspection, and intervene, and N is namaste. The highest and best in me acknowledges, appreciates, and offers myself in service to the highest and best in you. <laughs> 